Four months. If you had four months in the pool for how long Eric Bischoff would last in his role as executive director of SmackDown, then congratulations, you win a prize. Eric Bischoff was fired this week. On Tuesday, WWE announced a corporate shakeup of sorts with Bruce Pritchard, who was already back in the company. He had come back to the company in February after a number of years away. Uh, Bruce Pritchard was announced as the new executive director for Friday Night SmackDown, reporting directly to Vince McMahon, and thus, with Pritchard now being the, uh, the head cheese over there, thus ending any notion whatsoever, however thin it was to begin with, that SmackDown would have its own creative vision, independent of, uh, or maybe not even independent, but less influenced by Vince McMahon. That just went out the window. Bischoff has gone not only from the executive director role, he's gone from the company altogether. This was not him being reassigned. This was not him being promoted or demoted. This was him being fired. He was let go. He's no longer employed by World Wrestling Entertainment. Does he have some kind of non-compete like, like the talent does, where he can't just jump over to an AEW or something? That I don't know. I don't even know if he would want to do that. But he has gone from WWE. Now, Bischoff has largely been out of the wrestling business since his stint as the Raw General Manager ended in 2005. He had a couple of years or so with TNA. He came in with Hogan. He had some influence. I, I, the only thing I can recall hearing about at the time that was credited to Bischoff that I remember actually liking was that TNA reaction show. My understanding is that that was his idea or his concept or he pitched hard for it. And the way that they shot that at the time I thought was very innovative. That is the only thing I can think of that could be credited, possibly, to Eric Bischoff during his time in TNA. Otherwise, it was just constant a constant stream of stories about how, how disliked he was and how difficult he was to, to work with. He was not a very uh, beloved person by the talent then, behind the scenes, at Impact. And in The Observer this week, there was a source that uh, told Meltzer that Eric had no vision and he lacked the stamina for the rigors of this SmackDown job. Now, you know, you think, well, what are these rigors, right? What, what are these rigors, you might ask? You know, here's a person in Vince McMahon who calls creative meetings that a lot of times will go into the wee hours of the night. Then on... on uh, Tuesday, or I guess I guess now it would be uh, Friday, right? In a, in, a, in a typical week, we were hearing stories about this up until a few weeks ago. Two hours before the show, Vince McMahon would turn around and rip up the script, and he would write a new one. So imagine working on that creative team. And, and I don't even think Bischoff was really that heavily involved in, in like writing or anything like that. But imagine being involved with that creative team. You work on this script, which isn't very good to begin with. Because you're working within the parameters of what the old man wants, not, not what you think may be the best show. That's what, really what's going on here. I'm sure they have some very talented, creative minds on, on those teams. How could they not? Think of, the, think of all the writers they have under contract. Think of how big and bloated we've heard that these teams are. You don't think they have some people who are actually smart and creative? I'm sure they do. But they're not putting together the best show that they think is going to appeal to people. They're putting together a show that appeals to an audience of one. And they spend hours and hours and hours doing this. They're working overnight, midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., only to see it all blown up before the show. And all your work was for nothing. Now, with Bischoff, apparently he'd work a, a full day doing what? I don't know. I don't know what a full day in WWE looked like for Eric Bischoff. <laughs> I, I almost have visions in my head, what was it, uh, George Costanza on that episode of, of Seinfeld, where he doesn't really do much of anything. That was Eric Bischoff in WWE. Apparently he'd work a full day. And and the reason I say that also is because, by, by all accounts, Bruce Pritchard and Ed Kosky have basically been running SmackDown since the summer. This is not going to be a new role for, for Pritchard, only in title. He's already been at the helm of SmackDown now for, for three or four months. So anybody thinking that this show is all of a sudden going to have this radical change between the Pritchard promotion and the draft, man, this show is going to do a complete 180. It's going to be awesome. 
Pritchard's running it now. He's been doing this now for months and nothing has changed. And nothing will. But Bischoff would work a full day. I guess he's been trying to familiarize himself with the roster and how things work. Then he would go out to dinner with his wife. And then people in the company would complain that he was unreachable after 7 o'clock on some nights. And look, I work in a service industry. So I know what it's like to have to be on call 24-7 in the event of a crisis or an emergency you know, a client crisis of some kind. I, I'm sure some of you do also. I'm not the only one who works in some kind of service-related industry. You know, not not everybody can just leave work at five o'clock and and kind of turn off their phone and not be reachable. So I'm sure a lot of people listening to this can relate to that. But here's the thing: I don't get this guy had a good life, right? He had a he had a home. He had a cabin up in Wyoming, which was apparently his happy place. He was there with his wife. He didn't need this job. But he dropped all of that and he moved himself and his wife from Wyoming to Stamford, Connecticut. I don't know that you can get any further away from Wyoming in this country than Stamford. I mean, uh, geographically, I don't know if that's true, but I'm just saying. In terms of the life that he was living out there to the life I'm sure he was living in Stamford, you know, it's, it's going from one extreme to the other. I hope he didn't sell that cabin. He may have, but he uprooted, uh, he and his wife, to Connecticut for this. And four months later, they fire him. But the point I was getting at is that a lot of people know what it's like to have, you know, to have to work sometimes after hours. But imagine complaining about the guy because he went to dinner with his wife and then he couldn't, you know, he, he wouldn't answer his phone after working a full day. Oh, what a horrible thing. What a horrible thing. I'd turn my phone off too if I had to work with a person like that. Or I wouldn't have taken the job in the first place. Bischoff was gracious in his only public comments so far. He was tweeting good things about Bruce Pritchard because the two of them had become friends over the years. Called him a great producer and a good friend. Pritchard returned uh, in kind on his Twitter by saying some nice things about Eric. When this move was first announced, I said at the time, Despite my feelings about Bischoff in the past, about his resume of success in wrestling being very overblown, and I stand by that. I think people definitely overrate this notion that Bischoff is some kind of huge success. He achieved success in WCW, yes. And he did nothing of note ever since in wrestling. So he'll be in the Hall of Fame one day, and he's going to be remembered for a three-year period. Over 20 years ago. His entire reputation is staked on those 83 weeks. What has he done since then that would lead you to believe that he is some kind of creative genius or business genius? What has he done? Now, despite this, I said that I was still cautiously optimistic because at least it meant that there was a recognition that a change was needed. And Bischoff has made some comments, at the time he had made some comments not long before this, maybe last year. He was over in the UK, it might have been one of these Inside the Ropes uh, Q&A events that they do over in the UK. I listened to this soundbite, to this video, where he sounded quite reasonable as to why WWE's brand extension was such a failure. And why each show needs to have its own distinct brand identity he was saying all the right things, and I, I hoped, I had hoped that maybe just possibly he might be able to bring a different pair of eyes to a product that was, and still is, all these months later, badly in need of a refresh. And here we are. Here we are, four months later, with Paul Heyman supposedly leading or influencing the creative direction of Monday Night Raw, and the shows are no better than they were four months ago. You may get a few great matches on the show some weeks, but Monday Night Raw is every bit as insufferable to sit through on most weeks now as it was four months ago. And people will continue to make excuses. The draft, Solomonster, the draft, the draft is going to change everything. The wild card rule is gone and the draft is going to fix things. The draft is going to change nothing. Yes, I hope by ditching the wild card rule, 
the shows will be easier to follow and, and there'll be a slight improvement in that regard because the wild card rule was stupid from the moment that it was announced and they've said that they're getting rid of it now but the draft itself is going to change nothing it looks like we may be getting a, a program on SmackDown between Daniel Bryan and Shinsuke Nakamura. I like that idea. Two men who were already, though, on the same brand. How can you say that, you know, things are going to be radically different? The brand split will change nothing. Do you, do you realize, and I played this clip at the top of the show, and I did that for a reason. Do you realize that it has been almost one full year Ten months ago, Vince McMahon stood in the middle of the ring with his daughter, with his son Paul, with Shane McMahon, apologizing to the fans for not delivering the best product they possibly could and telling us that we are now the authority. Remember that? Triple H saying, you are the authority. I suppose that's just a very vocal minority, right, of internet fans, though? It's just people like me. Who complained about Monday Night Raw, right? Isn't that the case? Well, then why did they stand in the middle of the ring on live television and admit to the world that their television show sucks? Why, because a, a vocal minority said so? You think that's why they did that? They know it's terrible. They said as much on live TV. You don't need to take my word for it. It's still on YouTube. Go back and watch it. And they promised changes. You're going to see some new faces, which we did. But you're going to see that everything's going to be refreshed. And we're going to do a better job for you because you deserve it. All, all, they're saying all the right things. Kissing all of our asses. They promised changes. And here we are almost a year later. And yes, some of the faces have changed. The announcers have changed. The music has changed. The graphics have changed. The set has changed. All cosmetic. And some of them... I like some of those changes, but the show is still a bore on most weeks. Now, why is that? Why is that? WWE cannot fire its way out of this. They can fire as many people as they want. The only person that matters is the one at the top, and the person at the top is not going anywhere, which means that all of these changes are cosmetic and meaningless because it is still the Vince McMahon show, and Bischoff can be the scapegoat for today, Bruce Pritchard will be the scapegoat tomorrow. You can bet your ass on that. The same fate awaits him. He's smart enough to know that, though, because he's worked for Vince McMahon on and off for like 30 years. So I think if he plays his cards right, it'll take a little while longer for it to happen to him, you know, for him to be thrown under the bus. Heyman, who knows how long he'll last in that role. But it's always someone else's fault. So this week, Bischoff was the fall guy. This week, it was Eric Bischoff's turn. Maybe one day we can get his new uh, 83 Days podcast, and he'll be able to share what he really thinks about his time there. Meanwhile, they fired Bischoff, right, in favor of Pritchard, who's had his fingerprints on the show going back uh, months. And Friday's show fell for the second straight week, and it was a big drop, too. Last week's draft show did almost 2.9 million viewers on Fox. This week's show was down to about 2.4 million. And the only saving grace here is that they actually added 100,000 viewers from hour one to hour two. That means that in the span of just three weeks, their first show on Fox, right? Remember their first big show on Fox, October 4th, they blew it out, man. They had The Rock, they had some of these big names, they had a ladder match, they had a WWE Championship match with Brock Lesnar. So they really went all in on that first show. It's been three weeks, and in those three weeks, they have lost almost a million and a half viewers you know we talk about the ratings drops for aew and for nxt which are very real and i'm going to talk about that later but to lose almost a million and a half viewers that is quite the indictment of what people think of the wwe product right now they got these people probably a combination of, of newer viewers uh maybe some lapsed fans who haven't watched wrestling in a very long time they got these people to tune in on week one to check out the show, and those people basically said, yeah, I think I'm good, thanks. They are at Raw numbers. They are at Monday Night Raw numbers, and Monday Night Raw airs on USA. This is network television, and they're already at Raw numbers. And it's worth, it is worth pointing out, when you factor in the DVR numbers, that first Fox show that everyone thought did 3.8 million, 
actually ended up doing 4.4 million, which is which is a pretty big jump from 3.8 to 4.4. So the number this week, you would have to think that 2.4 million is also going to go up. I don't know if it's going to go up a lot. I don't know if it's going to go up a little bit, but you do have to factor in the DVR numbers as well. But even even when you factor them in, though, let's say the first show did 4.4. Okay, what's this week going to go up to? 2.7, 2.8. That's still a humongous drop. <laughs> you know, if, if it holds steady, the drop from week one to week three would actually be a hell of a lot more than a million and a half viewers. It would be worse. So, you know, with a drop like, I mean, I'm looking at this. I'm like, with a drop like that, they may rehire Bishop tomorrow just so they can fire him again. I said this on the podcast last Sunday. And I've seen others this week parroting the same talking point because it's true. Because people are coming around now to the idea, exactly what I said last week, wrestling is not hot. And yeah, a lot of that is just the WWE product. It's just, it's not cool anymore. But wrestling is not hot. It is not cool to the masses just because there is so much of it. There's more now than ever on television. Does not mean that it's hot. You can look at the Wednesday night numbers and see it. But you can also look at this show. You can look at SmackDown and see it. And there is not a wrestling show anywhere else on television with the kind of deal and and the audience reach on Fox that SmackDown has. And it has not made hardly any difference at all. And why should it? The McMahons getting a billion dollars out of Fox may be the biggest swindle in the history of television. 